What's up guys? Today on Dirt Lifestyle, we are gonna do a video that's a little bit different compared to the other two you've seen in this series so far. We're still gonna do fabrication, we're still gonna, we're gonna build these links and locate them and everything, but I really wanna take the time to make sure that I accurately convey the link separation, you know, link length, things like that, and how it changes the characteristics and handling of your vehicle overall. I wanna start this video by talking about rod ends. This is a three quarter inch Heim joint from Ballistic Fabrication. And this is a 2.63 inch ballistics joint from Ballistics Fabrication. The three quarter inch joint is extremely strong. And this is honestly all I would need uh, for a lightweight vehicle like I have. However, this is such a crucial component that I like to go way overkill on joints like this. I think it's really important to make sure that you have something that will not fail while you're out in the woods or on the trail. This joint and this joint were holding on the radius arms to my TJ for the last 10 years. Um, I installed these on the TJ in 2009 and they have been in service ever since. I've never had to rebuild them, which is why when I decided it's time to redo the suspension, first people I called was Ballistic Fabrication. They sent me joints, they sent me some brackets, some different things like that for this build and uh, that helps immensely. But everything that I'm saying in these videos is 100% my opinion. There's a reason that I came to them. This is a well-made, heavy-duty joint that has lasted in my, my Jeep for 10 years. Transmission is being held up by the skid plate. Now you can see why I had to make this little cutout for our drive shaft from this angle. Um, but everything seems to be fitting okay. I like it. I've only got, I don't know, four of the bolts holding them all in, but that should be good enough for our purposes so we can start mounting some links in here. Now that all of our ballistics joints are in their correct locations, I've got the axles set up exactly where I want them, and we can measure for our links. Now, I had to adjust all of these adapters to make sure that they're all the same. I adjusted them all to where there's only about a quarter inch of more adjustment to bring them in and bring them shorter. I always wanna have the ability to expand later, but because everything is so close to where it needs to be right now, I mean, I used lasers. I literally tried to get these axles just absolutely spot on. I think that I shouldn't need much adjustment uh, for now. So for the front links, I definitely wanted to make sure that they are almost bottomed out because there, these shanks are so big that I can actually, you know, I can grow the front probably three more inches. Later on down the road, if I do wanna expand the front out a little bit, which I think that eventually I will, um, I'll have that option and I won't have to uh, buy new bungs and new steel. I'll be able to just adapt what I have now. This part's easy. Now that the alignment and everything has been done, all we gotta do is measure from the shoulder of one bung to the shoulder of another bung. got all of our links mounted into the Jeep and set it all up so we can play with it and see what it does. The material that I chose to use for all of our links is two inch by quarter wall in order to make sure that our links stay straight and they don't get all tacoed on us. The angle of the lower links on the front and the rear of the Jeep are perfect. These are just about where I wanted them to be. Actually, I haven't checked them with an angle finder. Let's do that. Looks like the front lower link is eight degrees. Beautiful. The rear lower link is 
Eight degrees, looks like they both match perfect. The front and rear axles are both at ride height right now. So I measured from the floor to the center of the hub, 19 inches. So that's basically just to account for the fact that I like to roll around about six PSI whenever I'm wheeling. So I'm gonna lose a little bit of clearance. I know I've mentioned before that I use a left-hand thread joint on one side and a right-hand thread joint on the other. This is very common and it's for this simple reason. I can twist this and give myself a really nice alignment. So you can see that front axle moving. It makes it to where it's really easy to fine tune and adjust your suspension and make it to where your axles are placed exactly where you want them. You see this gray bar right here? This is a track bar that I've been running for like 10 years. It's like the only bar on this whole Jeep that I didn't build. This is a Rubicon Express bar that is made for a Jeep that has like a three to six inch lift. It hasn't been a big enough problem for me to upgrade it. And when I was doing all of this work for the new suspension, I planned on upgrading it. Um, I've been tossing it around back and forth in my head and I'm not, I'm actually gonna keep it. It's not optimal, it really isn't, um, for a couple of reasons. You want the length of your tie rod to be really close to the length of your panhard bar, or for some reason, if you own a Jeep, they call it a track bar. And this isn't, this isn't even close. And so what that does is as your front axle travels up and down, so if you're doing, you're going over a bunch of bumps in the desert, or you're doing whoops or whatever, as the axle goes up and down, it's going to push your wheel right to left. And I'm actually gonna give you a demonstration on exactly why. I took a four foot level and I set it up on the bottom of this rotor so you can see that this hub is completely straight and it is connected to the steering box right now. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put this through an extreme scenario and we're just gonna drop the suspension all the way out and what I predict is gonna happen is that this bar is going to, I think it will turn out to the right. So this is because of the different length of the panhard bar versus our track bar. And you can see it turned quite a bit and the axle's actually leaning over, making it look, it should actually be turned even more than this, but because the axle's leaning a little bit, it doesn't make it quite as extreme. But you would feel this in the steering wheel. As the axle's dropping out, it's gonna be turning the wheel one way or the other, and then as it comes back up, it's gonna be doing the same thing. If you do this quickly, then what it's gonna do is you're gonna feel the, the wheel do this. And this is what people call bump steer. And the sensation is caused by, you know, usually it's this, usually it's your, relationship between your pan hard bar or track bar to your tie rod. With hydro assist steering, you don't notice it that much. And basically this is gonna drive exactly like a Jeep with like a four inch lift would. Um, so still very manageable. It's not optimal, but it's gonna be enough work to change it that I'm gonna delay it. Because right now I'm thinking that in the next year or two, I will probably be stretching the front of this. And so for me to locate the track bar now to only cut it out and uh, then you know stretch this and have to relocate it here in a year or two, it just doesn't make a lot of sense in my situation. In the first episode of this series, we were talking a lot about suspension theory and just kind of basic rule of thumbs and just kind of ways to grasp exactly what's going on throughout the suspension travel. Most importantly, we talked about the pinion angle and its relationship to the transfer case throughout the suspension travel. This is a very crucial measurement depending on what your build is. There's two different ways of doing this. The way that I did it is the upper and lower links are the exact same length. What that's gonna do is it's gonna make it to where the pinion angle is gonna stay pointed at the transfer case throughout the suspension travel. And right now, we're actually gonna measure that and we're gonna make sure that everything in reality pairs up with everything in theory. The other way to do it would be to make your upper link shorter or longer in order to make your pinning angle do something that is desirable for your build. So if you have a daily driver, making your pinion angle stay true throughout the suspension travel, so basically making it to where it stays parallel to the ground, is gonna be good. You're gonna get the best ride quality on road if you had it set up that way. But the sacrifice is when you're off-road and you get extreme pinion angles whenever you completely drop out your driver's side or passenger side, um, that's gonna be really hard on your joints. This is almost always an off-road rig, so we're gonna make it a almost always off-road pinion angle. We're getting about seven degrees, so we have seven degrees of pinion angle right now. Now we're gonna slowly drop our axle, and what should happen is the pinion angle should become steeper. That's about all we need for this demonstration. I don't wanna drop it all the way to the ground. So now we are at 15 degrees. So what that means is that as this axle is dropping down, 
The pinion angle is doing exactly what we theorized it would do. It is staying pointed at its initial location throughout the suspension travel. Now, the downside. Along with our pinion angle, the steering angle changes as well. So what this means is that now I'm actually gonna be steering a little bit on the front of the tire whenever the axle is flexed all the way down. Uh, for me, it's not gonna be noticeable because I have hydro assist, or if you have full on hydraulic steering, you wouldn't notice it either. But if you have just a normal Jeep that has a, a steering that goes right off of the steering box and you have it set up this way, if you're on really big bumpy roads and stuff like that and you're going fast, it would feel less stable than if you had your upper link at 70% of the lower link because your steering wouldn't change basically throughout the suspension travel. It's gonna keep that pinning angle straight all the way up and down. The next thing we're gonna talk about is flex steer. And this is something that I feel like isn't covered enough. So we're gonna go through with the rear suspension. I'm gonna show you exactly what flex steer is. I just dropped this rear axle about as low as we can get it because I want you to be able to see the suspension. If you look close, you'll notice that these two upper links are at a triangular position. The lower links have just a little bit of triangulation. And what this is gonna do is help locate the axle side to side. So I don't have to have a track bar or anything whenever the axle shifts from right to left. But one of the side effects of having a suspension like this is that it will actually shift right to left as it cycles throughout its suspension. So let's see if we can simulate this and catch it on camera. So if I push one side down, you should see in the camera that the axle twists over to the passenger side. And if I take and cycle this up, it's going to do the same thing with the driver's side. And this is called flex steer. So this will actually be turning your vehicle slightly as your suspension travels right to left. So the question is, is there a way to fix flex steer? Yes. If you use a double triangulated four link, you will have the least amount of flex steer possible, but the triangulation or the degree of your upper links need to match perfectly with the triangulation or degree of your lower links. So right now, our lower links are almost parallel. They have barely any triangulation at all. But if we took where they mount on the outsides of the frame here and we moved that to the inside and we put it like on the center plate there, that would give us the opportunity to do a double triangulated four link and you can get rid of flex steer altogether. Basically in my case here, because of packaging, it's easier to mount a semi-triangulated four link. This is gonna work fine for our application, but it's still something that you need to think about whenever you're designing your own suspension from scratch. The pinion angle of our rear suspension is going to act exactly like the pinion angle did in our front suspension. Meaning that because the upper and lower links are the same length, this pinion will change throughout the suspension, always staying fixed on the output shaft of the transfer case. I've got one more concept that I wanna talk with you guys about today, and that is scrub radius. What it is, is the measurement between two imaginary lines. One imaginary line that's gonna go between your, basically intersect your upper and lower ball joint and then hit the ground, and then the other one is gonna come straight down and it's just the center line of your tire. Um, the smaller you can make that, the smaller amount of scrub radius you have. The larger you make it, the larger amount of scrub radius you have. If we push this tire away from the vehicle with wheel spacers or a super deep dish wheel, it's gonna make it to where as you're turning, you're having to like push the tire forward and push the tire backwards. If you can reduce that scrub radius to almost zero, like what I have, I've got very, very little scrub radius. It makes it so you can effortlessly push your tire to the front and to the back, and it's basically just spinning on the center of the tire and that is optimal for uh, lengthening the life of all kinds of stuff. Wheel bearings, upper and lower ball joints, your steering components. This makes it easier on all of that stuff. The best way to combat scrub radius is gonna be if you have wide axles, try to keep them as wide as you can. I know it's, it's the cool thing to narrow axles and I totally get it. It is cool for the right application, don't get me wrong. But this is a full width axle off of an F-150 going on a pretty narrow TJ. I knew that I could take some rims and I can suck these tires in to where it doesn't stick out too bad and I get a really big advantage by having a super small scrub radius. If you like the video and you wanna see more stuff like this, make sure you subscribe to our channel. Hit the thumbs up button if you haven't already. If you wanna follow me on social media, I'm at Dirt Lifestyle Nate. If you wanna uh, buy t-shirts, hats, stuff like that, go to thedirtlifestyle.com. We've got a whole bunch of new swag on there. We'll see you next time.